Good morning. It is, uh, it is a pleasure to be here this morning. My name is Breno. I'm one of the pastors here. I lead this beautiful worship team. Come on, every time it blows me away, right? Yeah, let's give it up for the worship team, like, like we mean it, right? Right, great. Um, anyways, um, I was asked to preach today, so that's where we at. Um, that's what we're having today. Um, listen, um, I've been, my wife and I, we, uh, we just last week celebrated six years of moving to America, which is a huge deal for us. We're so excited. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, here's my family. Uh, so my wife, beautiful, yeah, you know, that is just the work of the Lord that I ended up with her. It's, uh, it's a miracle. Uh, then we have Liam, who is about to turn three, and then there is Caillou, who is about to turn one. So this is my beautiful family. We just love this church. Uh, we moved out of here because the Lord told us to. Legit, there is uh, is a whole story. But I didn't come here because I was trying to find a better life or um, none of that. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying it wasn't my story. It wasn't our story. Um, we are. Uh, we've been married for almost 11 years. Wow. As I said that, it just I'm getting old. Um, but anyways, that's not the point. Today, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, because we've been there for over a decade now. Um, <laughs> we're taking our time. We're going really slow, but that's a good thing. Um, so last week, Kevin in the back there did a great job. Yes, Kev, come on. And we were in chapter 18, and we're going to continue on chapter 18 today. You know, he, uh, he told us the story in that scene where he preached on, it was when Jesus got arrested in the garden and the tension I was climbing. We're going to be looking at a text today where the tension and the pressure is through the roof. And we're going to be looking at how Jesus handled that versus how Peter handled that. Sound good? And then we're going to see the differences uh, there uh, and uh, hopefully... We're going to uh, learn a little more from Jesus, right? Um, so let's dive into the text, shall we? Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Um, reading is challenging for me, guys, but we'll be all right. All right. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of these men, uh, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me, uh, who have heard me what I said to them, and they, they know what I said. Um, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If, I, if what I said is wrong, bear witness uh, about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him uh, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon, P Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it again and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Um, before we dive in, can we pray? Let's pray together real quick. Jesus, here is uh, your word. I understand that outside of you, 
I can't do anything. So I pray that today, Lord, you would just prepare our hearts. Um, everyone under the sound of my voice, I pray that you would just take over now, Lord, and, and lead this room. We want to learn from you. So, uh, so help me step out of the way so you can do your thing and, um, and help us learn what you're trying to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, what we see here is, uh, is just a scene after the garden. So Jesus was arrested, most likely violently, by, but by a multiple, um, by like hundreds of men, really. A military man came, grabbed him, and they took him away. Now the disciples are dispersed. The tension is climbing. There is an angry mob there. It is cold. It's chaotic. It's the middle of the night. And now we see this scene where we are like, G- Jesus is over here, completely secure. And then we have Peter over here losing it, right? We're going to be looking at this contrast today. And the main differences, there are a ton, but we're, foc- we're going to focus on two today. The first one, big one here, is that Jesus operates from a place of faith, and Peter operates from a place of fear. Again, Jesus operates from a place of, fa- a place of faith, and Peter is operating from a place of fear. We've all been there. Now, Jesus, when it says, when I, what I mean by faith is, Faith is the assurance of the things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So Jesus is operating from his relationship with the Father. That is what is driving him. He sees beyond the moment. He is there. Everything that he says or does is coming from that place of deep intimacy with the Father. He knew the Father. He knew his character. He knew his power. But not only that, Jesus knew who he was. He was secure in his identity. Right? He's not here trying to prove anything. He is secure in who he is because he knows his purpose and he knows who called him to do that. Now, Peter over here, on the other hand, is operating out of fear. And fear is when our perception of reality leads us to the following conclusion. Oh, no, we're screwed. This is bad. And that is what Peter kind of like, that's where he landed. In his mind, he's like, this doesn't look like we're winning. This is not the best. Now, there is a dialogue in Matthew 16 between Jesus and Peter that is really interesting. It gives, it gives us an insight of the struggle that Peter had internally, which is pretty much the same that most of us in the, this room can relate to. In Matthew 16, Jesus had his disciples gathered, and he said, Hey, guys, listen up. I need to go to Jerusalem, and I need to be handed to the authorities there, and I shall suffer, and I will die, and then I'll, I'll be raised back to life on the third day. In which Peter goes, Lord, can we have a moment here, just the two of us? He pulls Jesus to the side, and he says... Yo, so, Lord, he didn't say yo, probably. He said, who can know, right? Uh, anyways, but he said, Lord, that, I don't, I think you're wrong on this one. You are not going to do that. You, you, you know, like, come on, man, like suffering, injustice, are you going to die? Uh-uh-uh. That doesn't sound like, you know, the king of the universe. That doesn't sound like victory to me. And Jesus is like, very iconic line here. Says to him, Behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to me. Now the next phrase that he says, because you're putting your mind on the things of men, not on the things of God. When we operate from that place where our minds are set on the things of this earth and the things of man, we sure, we're surely operating, and we're ruled by fear most of the time. That's what happened to Peter here. Now, in Peter's mind, victory looked completely different, right? And from that place where his mind is on the things of this world, now he's fighting for comfort, 
inconvenient immediately. Isn't that the story of our lives? The moment we lose track of the things of God, then all that matters is that moment for us. We're fighting for that comfort so hard, it's crazy. Now, that leads us to the next point, which is, while Jesus is seeking to fulfill his eternal purpose, Peter is seeking to find momentary comfort. Something happened back there. <laughs> so weird noise. Um, so Jesus is seeking to fulfill his eternal purpose, while Peter is seeking to find momentary comfort. Now look how sad verse 18 of this text is. It says, now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now, see that Peter now goes from being shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, and now he is shoulder to shoulder with the very ones that want to kill him. How crazy is that? In a moment over here, in the garden, Peter jumps out, puts his life on the line for Jesus. And then now he is standing shoulder to shoulder with the very same dudes that just took Jesus from him. That is sad. When our minds switch from the things of God to the things of this world, we lose track of who we, we, who we are and our eternal purpose and everything that matters is in that moment. Now, Peter gets a bad rap, right? We've all, you know, we've seen pastors. Uh, I, maybe, uh, I'm pretty sure I've done this too. It's like, oh, there goes Peter again, right? You know, what an idiot, you know, doing Peter things. Come on, Peter. But let me tell you, Peter was freaking legendary. He was a savage. He wasn't this coward guy. That's not his record. It's quite the opposite, though, Right? Like I said, Peter, moments before, he's, a, he's up against a, like hundreds of men, and he don't care. What we see here is a moment of weakness. But it's interesting, it's fascinating, because we stand out here in 2022 in cozy America, and we're like, come on, Peter. Bro, that was coward. Wait, what? We're looking at a guy that's pretty solid, that has a pretty great record, actually. But we, in reality, stand over here with a pretty bad record in rare moments of loyalty, and we're like pointing the finger. That tells so much about our culture, doesn't it? It's crazy. We're such a weak and fragile culture right now. We are just afraid of words, and we're just not doing great. It's just... That's where we're at right now. We can't tell the difference between words and war, right? We're terrified of being canceled online. Negative comments on social media. Ooh, that's bad. Right? We walk around with a sense of entitlement. Like, we, we can't see anything and not cast out our opinion as if it mattered. I'm not just going to say something about this real quick. Who cares, bro? You're not that important. It's just the truth. We walk around complaining about everything, right? About our jobs, how much we make, how much we don't make. We complain about the former president, this one, and we're going to complain about the next one and the next one. And for as long as we have a president, that will be a topic of, you know, fights for us. That's where... That's where the culture is heading. We're very shallow in everything, and we're, we feel like we're in the position to ju judge whatever. Man, we complain about the church that we go to, right? Oh, this, this is too loud. I don't like this. Oh, the pastor didn't say hi to me. Oh, I don't like this. We have a whole group of people. It's like, I don't go to church anymore. Because you know what? It doesn't represent what I believe. 
Who cares what you believe? Since when this is about you? Since when Jesus went to the, to the cross so you can have your opinion? That's, that's not good, guys. And I'm included in that too, right? So I'm not saying I do great. I do. I, I'm with you on that. We complain about the church we go to and the church that we've never been to, but we heard something on a podcast, right? It's like, whoa, that was super bad. That's why I don't go to church anymore. Oh, my world. Anyways, the last thing we want in this culture is to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. That's the truth. That's the reality that we're living in. Our faith has become irrelevant. There's virtually no difference between the world and the church. At least that's the stats. The stats are not great, guys, in the church. It's just the reality. Now, is this this the reality of the church around the world as an entirety? It is not. As we speak right now, there are over 302 million Christians under some sort of persecution around the world. You know who's not complaining all the time? You know who's not walking around with this sick, disgusting entitlement? It's the persecuted church. Isn't that fascinating? In the last year alone, we had almost 6,000 Christians killed for faith-related reasons. We had over 5,000 church buildings Attacked. We had almost 5,000 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Just think about that for a second. We're talking 6,000 people killed because of their faith. And I know this kills the vibe. If you came here for a good vibe sermon, this is where that gets punched in the face. We're talking, this, these are brothers and sisters that set their minds on the things of God and died for it. Let me tell you a story. So I have a friend that works uh, with a persecuted church around the world. He helps them out by uh, opening up lines of credit so they can, you know, kind of maintain themselves. Because like some of these countries, you, you can't hire a Christian. So that's where, like, persecution goes from that to capital punishment, right? In which most of us in this room don't have even the frame of reference to understand what that is. But this friend of mine said, hey, let me tell you the story of this dude. Um, he is, um, he's a, this guy was a former uh, Muslim in Sudan, and he was from a family that was very... Um, very engaged in fighting Christianity. And then one day he was in a hotel uh, room in 1994, and he found one of those little uh, New Testaments, you know, that you find in that uh, drawer uh, in your hotel room. And he picked that up, and he was like, I'm going to read this because I need to know my enemy. I need to know to better strategize so I can combat this ideology, this, uh, this religion. So he starts in, you know, Matthew, and he goes through it. Then Mark hits. He's continued to read through. Once he gets to Luke, he stops and he says, I think I believe this. And in that room, with nobody around him, he gives his life to Jesus right there. And then he goes home, and guess what? His family kicks him out of the house, disown him, and said, you, don't you dare show your face here anymore. He ends up being on the streets for three years as a homeless person until a guy, another Christian undercover, is praying, and God tells him to go find this guy. He goes and finds him, takes him home, gives him shelter, gives him food, starts to disciple this guy, 
For years, he lived in his house. He eventually married this other dude's daughter. And he, uh, he now has a wife and three kids, two boys and one girl. One of the boys, the youngest one, has special needs. So he becomes very engaged in, in, in the church of Sudan, and my friend gets connected with him. So now this guy, his name is Mohammed. He is the main contact for my, 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 uh, my friend's agency in Sudan. So my friend goes over to visit, to check on the people there, to see how they're doing and all that. Muhammad is taking care of the whole schedule. He's driving him around. He knows everybody. He knows the needs, and he's happy, and he's pumped about that. Then towards the end of the, the trip, my friend says, okay, so uh, Muhammad, I'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. for breakfast here, and then we're going to go out. Sound good? He's like, yeah, sure. Next day rolls in, and it's 9 a.m., where's Muhammad? 9.30, no Muhammad yet. 10 rolls around, no Muhammad. 10.30, not even a sign of Muhammad. Around 11, Muhammad walks in the room, beat up, missing a tooth, bleeding, black eye, smells bad. His, his whole clothes is destroyed. My friend looks at him, and then, dumb question, right? Asks him, what happened? And this dude works with the persecuted church, right? He said, Muhammad, what happened? Oh, they got me again. Wait, who got you again? Who, I mean, who are you talking to? Do you know these people? Yeah, you know, it's not the first time. It's the same group of people, same group of guys. They showed up in front of my house with a van and waited for me to get out. And then they, uh, this time they gave me an option. They said, you either renounce your faith or you leave the country. Mohammed said, I'm not going to do that. So they beat him down until he was unconscious. Then they peed on him and they left. So my friend is over here agitated, right? He's like, come on, man. That's, oh, man, we got to do something about it. He's like, no, it's all good, man. It's all good. My friend goes, how often does this happen to you, man? He said, well, average two in every two weeks. My friend is having a hard time here. He's like, Mohammed, you have wife and kids. Are they safe? Mohammed said, well, Last time we sent our daughter out to grab some stuff at the market, right around the corner, a girl threw a brick and hit her back. And she's having trouble to walk ever since. What about your boys? Well, my boys rarely ever leave the house. Last time they did, a group of kids surrounded them. And I'm talking about... One of Muhammad's kids got special needs, and they start stoning him. So he said, my, my kids don't leave the house. And then my friend said, okay, but what about your wife? Is she safe? She's good? He said, well, not too long ago. Um, and this, by this time, Muhammad's expression changed. He said, well... We were getting ready to go to bed, and seven guys broke into our house. They locked my kids in the bathroom, and they tied me to a chair, and they uh, took my wife and made me watch. And then Muhammad said, I'm ashamed to say this, but this was the only time I considered denouncing my faith and renouncing my faith. You know I didn't, why I didn't do it? Because my wife, during the whole thing, was screaming, don't do it. Don't do it. Whew. 
And then at this point, my friend is like, this is it. Enough is enough. We're going to get you out of this country. I got connections. I know a guy that knows a guy. We're going to take you out of here. This is ridiculous. And then he stops my friend and says, hey, stop. I'm not going to go anywhere. And then my friend goes, you're going to die. You don't understand that. He said, you don't understand. I already died in 1994 inside of that hotel room when I found Jesus. He said, Jesus died for my nation. Nothing less than that makes any sense to me. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be buried here. Muhammad understood something that we need to understand too. There's a calling for all of us. The problem with this whole story is that we read the same Bible. Muhammad and I are reading the same Bible. The problem with this is that I say I'm a Christian. And Muhammad says he's a Christian. And to be honest with you, I don't know what to do with that most of the time. Now, I understand that the circumstances here are different. I'm not trying to say we're going to go through that kind of persecution today or tomorrow. What I am saying is that the call is the same for Muhammad and for me. It's the same for you and for you. And the call is to deny ourselves, lay our lives down, to then find true life in Christ. That's what we need to understand. Now, the beautiful thing about the grace of God is that he's not up there pissed at us right now being like, don't you get it? Come on. No, he's excited for you to finally get this and start living for something greater, far greater than your career, than your education, or your political ideology. Jesus is now saying, hey, church, wake up. There is life beyond this. There is life beyond your own personal kingdom that you're fighting so hard for. There's meaning, there's purpose that goes beyond this. Say yes to it, and you see what I mean. To find life, we must die for ourselves. That is the only call. There's no way around it. That is what the Lord is calling us today to, to die for ourselves. But this is not a morbid, weird calling. In reality, what he's saying is, I have life to give to you. But in order to access that, you need to die for the things of this world. You need to set your minds on the things of God and not the things of this world. And when, when you do that, trust me, guys, it's worth it. It is worth it. You know why? Because he is worthy of that. Now, you're not Jesus. You're not Peter. You're not Muhammad. You're a Christian living here in 2022 in America. How do you say yes to this invitation to find life in Christ? Well, it starts by understanding that the things you have are not for you. The things that you have are not yours in the first place, and they're most certainly not for you only. So to understand that, you take a step back and look at three main things 
what you do with your time, what you do with your talent, and what you do with your treasure. Once you do that, then you ask God, show me what do you have for me today as I go to work. It might look like some, some of you might have to stop a task right in the middle of a busy day to then finally give your attention, undivided attention, to a co-worker that desperately, desperately needs you. And maybe you're going to have to stop everything you're doing, and that might impact your performance. But then, once you do that, this co-worker of yours, maybe, just maybe, will open up. And maybe, just maybe, you're going to have an opportunity to speak life into that person's life. And maybe, just maybe, you're going to mention Jesus, and then that person is going to find eternal life. For some of you in this room, you've been sitting on a lot of money, yo. And you don't know what to do with that. And please don't hear me say, oh, you, you got to give money to the church. That's the last thing I wanted you to hear. I'm not saying, oh, man, you should give more. It's not about that. It's not about how much you give. It's how much you dare to keep. You know what I'm saying? For some of you, it's opening up your house. For some of you, is turning your anger against this issue and this issue into prayer. Turning that into a cry on your knees. When was the last time you were on your knees before God? I'll go deeper in that. When was the last time you were on your knees crying out to God for something that wasn't related to you directly? There's more, guys. I'm tired of this Christianity where, like, we come to church and we do this whole thing here and then we go about our lives and Christianity is just an add-on to it. I want to understand what Muhammad understood. I want us to understand that. And I imagine what church would be like if we get it. Imagine how our worship would be impacted by that. No more like standing in the back like this as we are worshiping the king of kings, yo. This is serious, guys. This is not a joke. We're not playing here this Christian game. Some of you had a fire burning in you years ago maybe to go do something and devote your life to a bigger cause. You're sitting on it behind a desk on a nine-to-five job. Maybe some of you, the Lord is saying, you got to quit your job. You got to quit your job. Maybe some of you here, the Lord is saying, you got to end this relationship. You know it's not good for you. You know what I'm saying? Maybe some of you need to write a big check to someone. I don't know what it, it looks like for you, but I, I, I encourage you today to start this by asking him. As we pray today, take this time and say, and say Lord, I, show me where to start. What is my next step? Whatever you do, just don't be passive. Because the Lord is opening up our eyes today. What are you going to do with that? He is out there screaming out, come on, guys, let's go. Please say yes. This is the, more, the most exciting, fulfilled life you can possibly have. Is to deny yourself to then find life in him. Is to die for yourself to then find life in Jesus.
These are the words, the words of Jesus, and I'll close with that. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet lose their soul? Let's pray. Father, we hear your words here today, and this is a hard one. It's a hard one for us, Lord. We're so, we're drowning in our comfort. We're holding on to our convenience so badly, Lord. But we want to say yes to you today. Would you reveal to us what the next step for us is? Lord, we want to be who you called us to be, Lord. So would you please lead us there? Our yes is on the table today. Lead us, Lord. Lord, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. I pray that the dreams that you're right now planting on some of these people's hearts, Lord, would flourish. Lord, I pray for boldness to do things that we don't even know we could do. Lord, I'm praying for revival that starts with us. I'm praying, Lord, for a revival that starts with repentance. Lord, we're so comfortable, Lord. We've traded the truth for comfort. Help us change, Lord. Would you help us, Jesus? Because you are worthy. You are worthy. And we love you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.